Oh, here we go. Sauropods, succinctly known as the giant ass dinosaurs. Okay. Your sauropods, these are the guys with the long necks that make the stereotypical image of a dinosaur whenever people think about it. As we were pointing out earlier, most of us, I love these images because this guy knows he's screwed. He's trying to look at his face. And this one's just about to get punted in the junk or something. I was like, oh, good for them. But to start off with sauropods, so you remember our cladograms going through our family groups. You guys remember what group they belong to out of the Giscians? Sorisia. So they are Sorisians. Yep, they are the lizard hip dinosaurs are in that group. You have a larger group that includes the sauropods called the prosauropods that includes some of their most distinct ancestors. Here's a uh, cladogram that um, I would much rather talk about this cladogram, obviously, for this. So for sauropods, to give you a family tree, again, they're part of a group called sauroscians, so they've got those lizard tips. They are basically a sister group, or you could say, yeah, a sister group of theropods of the meat eaters. You guys remember making that cladogram the other day? And you remember how the sauropods and the theropods connected at the base? Okay, so you've got that common ancestry. They're called a sister group. You have what are called basal sauropodomorphs. I'm talking about cladograms. When I say basal, what in the flip am I talking about? Can I remember? What's that? Most primitive? Or... Yeah. Primitive, I'd say the farther down here is more basal. As you go up here, it's less basal. That just means less fancy features, more fancy features. So if you hear something as a dinosaur and it's basal, that just means it's lower down on the family tree. You can have your sauropodomorphs, which include things like, you've probably never heard of one called Saturnalia, which is a really primitive prosauropod, which is just a fancy word for almost sauropod, I guess you'd say. Maybe you guys have heard of Platyosaurus from Germany that is a nice prosauropod. You get up here to the actual saur sauropods. What is the feature this cladogram shows us defines actual sauropods or features? So here's sauropods. What's the feature on the cladogram that all sauropods have? The prosauropods, more basal ones, don't have. Obligate quadruped. So they're obligate quadrupeds, meaning they have to walk on four legs because they're so big. And what else? Shorter snout. Shorter snout. So just to review on how to read platograms, but that is one feature that's used to define these sauropods. Then you can get much, much more picky oh, with yeah, loads of other shit. Yeah. <laughs> so prosauropods. So again, these basal guys, they're going to have leaf-shaped teeth, which large serrations. You guys remember on the theropod teeth? I don't know what the serrations are. Almost like yeah, like on a steak knife, they're these little almost like this. So prosauropods have leaf-shaped teeth. This is gonna be a terrible drawing, but something like this. And their serrations are kind of bumps on the edges here. Terrible, terrible picture. You don't see prosauropod teeth much because they're just not as common. But they have kind of a compared to like an iguana tooth. They're generally quadrupedal, which is four legs, but they looks like some of them at least were able to have a bipedal ability, at least part of the time. They have a jaw joint below the tooth row. So I'm trying to say, I don't have a good skull to show that, but I'll show you later. And they have what are called gastrolis. Have you guys ever seen those rocks that they say were tumbled around their bellies? Look nice and polished, okay? They have found gastrolis in the prosauropods and sauropods. Um, I won't believe it's a gastrolis, though, unless I see it in the rib cage, because it's pretty easy to find polished rocks um, just in the riverbeds where you find these things. But if you find it in a rib cage, then fair enough, it's a gastrolis. So prosauropods are among the earliest of dinosaurs. When did dinosaurs first show up? 239 years ago. What was the period of the Mesozoic? Triassic. Yeah, they showed up in the later Triassic. Um, prosauropods lasted into the Jurassic during this time. There was one big continent, what was it called? Pangaea. Pangaea. And you had a dry climate, basically a big desert continent. But that's where these prosauropods evolved and thrived for a while. So I mentioned they have those serrations on their teeth. They also have long necks. 
they have a special jaw articulation. So when I talk about jaw articulation, that just means the way your jaws fit together. But that jaw articulation is offset. Basically, what you've got going on is all the teeth come together at once. That's all we care about. The teeth come together at once. And they have slightly pneumatic vertebrae. When I talked about pneuma, pneumaticity, I guess you'd say, what in the hell am I talking about? Pneumaticity. Air pockets in the bones. Air pockets in the bones. Okay, lots of air pockets in the bones, kind of thinly constructed. Let me actually show you some of these animals. So here is, I'm going to assume this is Platysaurus. So, yep, it says right here. Platysaurus, which is known from Western Europe. There are places where they'll find multiple skeletons of these animals together. And it looks like they were maybe mired, so trapped in the mud and got stuck. This is an example when we were talking about dinosaur art before. Um, what people call shrink wrap dinosaurs. This is when artists reconstruct dinosaurs and make them look skinny as hell and don't actually put like muscles and stuff on them. But look at these poor guys. They're like, they're just starving to death. It's like a string bean. I know, you feel for them. It's <laughs> like, not a string bean. Look, it's just sad. But uh, if you hear me talk about shrink wrap dinosaurs, that's me criticizing paleo art that way. But one thing that's interesting with uh, platysaurus, some of these prosauropods, they had big hands with big claws. You can see the claws right here. And again, they could be bipedal, like you've got mounted here, or quadrupedal, just depending on what the animal wanted to do, really. One of the better known ones is from Africa called Massospondylus. So he's got, here you can see kind of his leaf shaped teeth if I zoom in. In this case, they're almost pig like, they're not well preserved. But anyway, you can see his teeth there. And you can see these things again, they're like your little sauropods, except it's kind of cool to think of things with a long neck like that running around. <laughs> kind of crazy. You'd be like in a in your kitchen and have one stick its head through the window or something like that. That'd be kind of cool. These guys get moderately large. So what I mean by that is maybe five meters long, so about 16 feet. Super skinny neck, super skinny tail. Skulls, again, are not super big. Why do you think it doesn't have a super big skull on the end of this long neck? You don't got much room brain to hold. <laughs> yeah, you imagine having a muscle dip a whole bit. <laughs> Pardon me for just uh, a medical thing. Hello? Imagine having to eat with yeah. long and this family. If you had a big brain, you just like ripple <laughs> with it. I just imagine the way it runs and the neck, and obviously it doesn't, but the neck just like. <laughs> I feel like it would be like those, like the chickens. <laughs> or like those things that are in front of like auto shops. The yeah, exactly. <laughs> Imagine the neck. I know it would, but at the same time, in my heart. <laughs> In my heart, I imagine that they just are the balloon. Yeah. Even though, you know, they're probably like ostriches, you know? I mean, they were super heavy. Lead balloon. I really don't understand the scale of these things sometimes, and then they have the, like, pictures of the bones next to it, and it's like, shh. Yeah. <laughs> Way taller than us. It's a big boy. It's a big boy. Yeah. Sorry, I had to take a dog call. So, okay, what the hell are we talking about? Mass spondylus. Okay. So, uh, to go to this, I just like one for my yard. Like, you heard of those giant, like, Home Depot skeletons for Halloween? Well, let me introduce you. <laughs> yeah, let me do the one that actually is accurate because I'm a nerd. One of the coolest things with Mass spondylus, so they've actually found the BBC. Here's a little baby right here. And the cutaway isn't an egg. It's just a cutaway showing you how it would have fit in the egg. 
if I remember correctly, there was a paper just last year or recently where they studied these exact specimens. And it turns out these guys had soft shell eggs, kind of like turtles, for this sort of dinosaur. There's lots of dinosaurs we know from hard shell. But these guys had kind of soft shelled eggs. Um, the eggs would have been about six centimeters long. So that's like two and a half inches, something like that. The embryos don't even have teeth yet, but they got a cute big head and they had a cute big eye and all just little sort of pot puppies. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so uh, why don't they have a huge skull? Oh, yeah, sorry, that's what I was talking about. I got distracted. So I was asking you that because you can just think how much muscles you need to have a giant skull right here with a long neck like that. So you'd have to have a huge beefy neck, support the beefy skull, which would mean you'd have to have a counterbalance beefy tail out here and little tiny arms and legs still, which would be crazy. You'd be falling over yourself. Yeah, you'd be unbalanced. <laughs> I'm mentally unbalanced, but this would be physically unbalanced. Okay, other examples. So this is actually just showing another skeleton of the Mosasaurus. Um, different one out of the egg. But again, you can see, I don't know, let's pretend this is quarter size for this South American coin or whatever. Okay. <clears throat> you can see this nice example right here. Oh, sorry, I got confused. Massospondylus and mussosaurus. This is a different genus. So I was just thinking about that. This is from Argentina. But again, it shows you that these giant, and I just love that skeleton there too. <laughs> these giant things just started off the same, just cute little tiny babies with giant eyes. The same thing, these are late Jurassic, early Cretaceous. I mentioned the big claws on their front feet. The term manis is for like hands or front feet. Do you guys have any guesses what they could possibly use big claws for on their front feet? Lifting foliage? Maybe helping to dig up plants. Okay. Um, what else? Defense. Defense. Give me another one. This is all speculation. We don't know, but let's see. Think some ideas. Could it be to like, um, I want to say like maybe attract mates too? Cool, you yeah, have the big sexy claws, I suppose. Maybe. <laughs> Am I going to get better dates if I dress like Freddy Krueger? Is that what we're saying? It hands. <laughs> yeah, but like, I'm not going down there. <laughs> what else could they be doing with their claws? Self defense. Self defense, you mentioned. Are you giving a hint? We're looking at the babies and the eggs. Making nests? Making nests. Maybe digging for nests. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. But these are all possibilities. We don't know. We don't have a good answer, but these are possibilities. Sure. Because of their teeth, um, again, they're generally thought to be plant eaters, herbivores, but their teeth could have handled maybe eating little mammals and bugs and stuff like that, too. We don't know for sure. But these guys were the dominant herbivores when dinosaurs were starting out, just before we got to the actual giant sauropods. Um, eventually they went extinct at the end of the early Jurassic, and there is no good reason for that that I have heard, but it is a, a good question hanging out there. So get the sauropods proper. Okay, surprise, surprise, they're giants. The smallest sauropods, I think, are elephant size, are actually some known from Europe. Um, if you guys heard the idea, um, I forget what they call it. Like, you can see what wolf is like? Yeah, dwarfism, that is, there it is. Where animals in a small environment will evolve over time to be smaller so they don't uh, overcompete and run out of resources. So you have dwarf sauropods known from ancient European islands that are like horse size. And that's as small as they get. I mean, that's kind of cool. You could have those out in your pasture, I suppose. But uh, generally, they are these freaking giants. Again, the very first ones show up in the late Triassic. They go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So these guys were around the whole time. Just about the dinosaurs were around, at least past the late Triassic. As far as I know, there's about 100 valid genera, um, but these can be pretty fragmentary. Usually it's a few big ass bones and it's hard to find the skull, but you can have anatomical features that help you know if it's something special. Only 22, so about 25% of these are known from good skeletons. Which do you think is the hardest part of a sauropod to find? Skull, okay. And any dinosaur, and generally fossil reptiles, skulls are hard to find because in mammals and humans, our bones fuse in our skull. So it's basically an upper and lower unit, at least once we're an adult. Think of like when babies are born, how they have kind of a malleable head because their bones are loose. Dinosaurs, those bones, all these different bones in the skull never fuse together. So they tend to break in like two dozen pieces when they die. And it's, I've never found a good skull. I found pieces, 
but never a good skull. So again, extra credit on our field trip, okay? <laughs> but you don't usually find skulls of sauropods. Another problem with them, what do you think is another problem with studying sauropods? Something I've whined about. Too big. Too stinking big. They're expensive to collect, take a lot of time to prepare, and you literally need giant areas and forklifts to store them. Um, if we have a chance on our dinosaur trip, Maybe we'll stop at the BYU Museum where I did my master's. But there they basically have a giant warehouse with pallets with the sauropod bones on them and a forklift and like three or four layers of shelving that all those giant ass bones are stored on. And so when you need to study them, it takes a lot of effort. I just have a weird side question. Mm -hmm. Most of like the specimen stuff, obviously, that's in the museum stuff is like casts and stuff, right? Um, the ones that are on display are generally casts, not always, mm -hmm. but generally. So, so where did they, did they like actually move the, the actual specimen bones, or at least try to? I know they're really fragile. Um, yeah, it depends. Sometimes they like to put the real ones on display because, yeah, it's always cooler. Yeah. But it just depends how hard it is to move, mm -hmm. how easy it is to break. And um, if scientists need access to them to study them, it's harder to study when you've got all the bones mounted in the skeleton. So it just kind of depends on the situation. But good question. Hi. Uh, sauropods. Almost all of them have long necks. I think one of the slides here hopefully shows one of the weird short necked ones. Yeah. But why do you guys think they had long necks? What would that do? To reach, to reach, reach and eat. What else? Other ideas? Self defense. Maybe self defense. There's actually a lot of money. <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> but it's not in my. I mean, you've got a 25 foot long neck with a bunch of muscle, and your little theropod runs up to attack it. You could just wham. <laughs> And knock him over as long as he isn't able to bite your neck. Giraffes do it too. Mm -hmm. Giraffes do combat with their neck. Yeah, I thought about a um, patasaurus having that kind of behavior, or like theoretically, hypothetically. I'm trying to remember if they've seen actual injured bones in the neck that suggested that. I'm not sure, but that's possible. But yeah, it's thought that their necks could have been long to help them get food. And we'll talk more about that. There's a video we'll watch at the end here. And the way they did this again is they just made their vertebrae super long and pneumatic. Basically, they would take some of the vertebrae from the back and they would shift forward in the neck, so to speak, and you'd get longer vertebrae and more. Some took that to an extreme. So one of the first sauropods known was called Brontosaurus or Patasaurus. You guys have probably all heard about that. That is, um, it might be an Apatosaurus that we're digging up on our field trip. I think it's a Diplodocus, best I can tell, but it's something similar to Brontosaurus or Apatosaurus, where we'll be digging up more of the vertebrae. But Apatosaurus was first found way back in the Bone Wars in 1877. Thinking of it, I don't think, did we even talk about Copen Marsh in some of our intro, the Bone Wars? Okay, so the Bone Wars, to give you a very uh, succinct definition of that, some of the earliest paleontologists in the late 1800s, one named Cope, one named Marsh. They started off as friends, but they both liked dinos, and they turned into bitter enemies. And Cope and Marsh were always trying to outdo each other and see who could discover the most dinosaurs and get the most attention. How good do you guys think something like that is for science? If you got people competing really fast. Not good as in you get a lot of crappy science. It's good you get a lot of specimens, but these guys were so anti against each other that they had people that would be hired that would go into the other one's camps when they weren't there and they'd like destroy the fossils and stuff. So, so they went nuts. There was a, for a while, they were gonna have Steve Carell, and Will Ferrell do a movie based on Cope and Marsh. I thought that would have been so awesome, but then it never happened. But that would have been cool. But this is something that happened where with Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus, to give you an idea of some of this sloppy science, is Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus were both defined by Marsh. They were sauropods. It turned out that Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus were the same. And so they had to say, okay, we're going to now call these the same species. And then just a few years ago, they separated them again. But to give you an idea how that can go back and forth on trying to define species. <clears throat> well, as far as relationships of different sauropod groups. So we kind of showed you this before. We're going to go through a bunch of different groups that I want to get through. And I'll let you read that on your own. We don't need to go through the uh, specifics. But there are different general groups you hear about. So I mentioned the animal we're going to try and dig up on our field trip. Um, that's probably some sort of diplodosoid or diplodosid would be right here. 
I suspect it's Diplodocus. I mean, it could be Barosaurus or Apatosaurus, which is probably one of these guys. We have a group of sauropods called the Diplodocids. These are the ones that are skinnier with super long necks. You have a group called the Macronarians. We'll talk about in a minute too that have a distinct difference. So if you look at these skulls, these are all sauropod skulls. This one looks particularly derby, mm -hmm. but what are some differences you see between these skulls? Jaw shape. Jaw shape. Yeah, this one gets really beefy at the end. This one's more graceful, meaning thinner and less heavy. What's that? Yeah, you got like a slide right here. <laughs> Basically, a slide right here. Like a here. high heel. High heel, yes. <laughs> it actually it looks like a high heel. So those are different ways that uh, sauropod groups have been defined um, that we'll talk about in a minute. But to give you an idea, so what percent did I say or, uh, of sauropods are known from a good skeleton? About 20%, 22%. Yeah, okay. And I mentioned that skulls are even more rare. There have been instances where paleontologists have put the wrong skull on the long sauropod. Have any of you guys ever been to Dinosaur National Monuments? Lucky. It'd be another field trip. We could. But uh, I do field work out there, near there, sometimes outside the monument. But there they have a, um, a huge quarry and thousands of dinosaur bones and great skeletons. It's this giant wall of bones. That's really cool. But they recovered some different sauropod dinosaurs from there, including Apatosaurus and was called Camarasaurus. And because they didn't find the skull of Apatosaurus with an Apatosaurus skeleton, they just assumed it had a skull like this. And they just sculpted this. Isn't that like... Oh, and since I can't do my connect to the internet, he's not doing his thing. But isn't that a lovely hypothetical sauropod skull? <laughs> and they were doing the best they could, but it turned out that the apatosaurus skull was much, much different. It was actually, they should have had this skull on that animal instead of one like that. But that's just, you do the best you can with science. When you're missing a head, you try and use educated guesses in science, okay? So sauropods, these are higher up on the cladogram. And if you want to get specific about how to diagnose them cladistically, you're going to say it's all sauropodomorphs. That means all these, including things like platysaurs, that are more closely related to a random sauropod called saltosaurus from the Cretaceous of Argentina than platysaurs. platysaurs. So basically, to summarize, they're saying this chunk of the cladogram is your sauropods. Uh, so if you want to get technical with the anatomy of sauropods, who wants to say this word for me? Oh, come on, you need better than that. Now, centra diapophyseal, if I can say it, lamina on anterior and mid-cervical vertebrae. Oh my goodness, I keep thinking how we should have a little sub-lecture where I go through terms like this. It'd probably be good. But that's just saying you've got some fancy little thin bone sheets on the neck vertebra. The femur, anyone know where the femur in your body is? It's your thigh bone, right here. The femur is a lymph bone cross-section, okay? And then the ulna, which is in the forelimb, has kind of a triangular end. You don't need to know these, but this is just showing you how crazy it gets still to define these crazy things. Okay, so sauropods, are sauropods popular in the general public? Yeah. Are dinosaurs popular in general? Yeah. Are some paleontologists out in the media a lot? Can you see them on TV? Sometimes. Okay. Well, let me put it this way. Paleontologists are people. So one thing that comes with sauropods that I mentioned right here is you get a lot of ego involved and a lot of people um, trying to outdo each other. So it's almost like Cope and Marsh now, only luckily they're not going out with explosives and destroying each other's specimens as far as I know. But you get a lot of people arguing and lovingly to hatingly, is that a word, fighting about these sauropod problems. They always want to outdo other people. You know, everyone wants their little, little five minutes of fame. So example of this, you can see all over. And also, it's kind of hard to define big or largest. So if I talk about the largest dinosaur in the world, can someone think about some complications that might make you say, well, how exactly are you measuring Say it's largest. Fragmentary specimens. Um, so you could do it by completeness. I'm thinking more about like body size ish. 
But can you guys think of some questions that might come up if you say, this is the biggest of this in the world, or some people might say, well, do you mean this or this or this? Length, like height. height length, thickness. height, thickness, weight, okay? Those are problems you get with all this stuff where, and you'll see this like every year in the news, largest dinosaur ever discovered, and you'll always see the headline. And it's like, okay, do you mean the heaviest, the longest, the tallest, the widest? What do you mean? Pretty sure there already was one like this year. I saw it. A news article but a few days ago probably a titanosaur from yeah. south america yeah. but you'll see that all the time and that's something to keep in in uh, thought when you see these articles but as far as some of the biggest known sauropods um until recently there are ones known as supersaurus and ultrasaurus that were from utah from the rocks we'll be looking at from what i understand this turned out to be bigger specimens of diplodocus if i remember right now they've been overtaken by south american dinosaurs South American sauropods. All right, so sauropods are big, long necks, tiny skulls. Their teeth get a little bit different. You'll see this in the lab. And they have more pneumatic vertebrae, higher degree of pneumacity compared to the uh, prosauropods. You can see an example to remind you of pneumacity. So here is an apatosaurus. Skeleton's a little out of date. His tail shouldn't be hugging the ground and stuff. But you guys see how you have that hole, pneumatic hole right here? Got one here, got one here, got more here, got more here. These guys are really, really full of holes, for lack of a better term. This is in the tail, this is in the rear end, this is in the back, this is in the neck. But you can see they're very pneumatic. One of the easiest ways to recognize things, um, if we have a chance, and you remember to ask me, and we have time, on our field trip, ask me to take you up to where you see one of these in cross section, and Again, I don't do much with sauropods, but I just saw in this rock wall, I'm not going to draw this very well, but I just saw all these lines of bone kind of like this. And I'm like, oh, that's a big sauropod neck bone just cut through the middle where all you're seeing are those thin struts of bone and not the outside of it. All right, to classify sauropod vertebrae, you've got to get really, really nitpicky with different parts of their vertebrae. So again, you don't have to memorize this, but you can have things, if you look right here, the different colors represent different features. This is what the sauropod scientists do, is you'll hear them talking about, oh, you have a well-developed paradiapophyseal uh, lamina, but the intraparazygopophyseal, whatever, isn't as well-developed, but it has a really good um, spinodopheseal, but the neural spine is kind of short. So you'll be like, what the hell are you talking about if you aren't used to sauropods? But those are, again, things you can use so you can see in these different vertebrae how these different bone struts have different patterns. And that's where these scientists are using this to identify the animals. You can see this one where you've got the two tall neural spines. This is crazy. But again, that's uh, if you want to be a sauropod paleontologist, that's what you're going to have to deal with. Common groups of sauropods. So I mentioned the diplodocids. These guys are basically long and skinny. They include animals like Apatosaurus, and Brontosaurus, and Diplodocus, and Barosaurus, you maybe have heard of those. Typical dipl diplodocids, if I can say it. Um, here is at the Carnegie Museum here, Diplodocus. This skull, if you go just south of Salt Lake to Thanksgiving Point, you can see it at the museum there. Diplodocids have long, thin teeth. So here's one tooth right here. You'll see that in the lab, I think, when they ask you a question about it. But Diplodocids, Apatosaurus, et cetera, have long, thin teeth. You guys see all the teeth right here? What's weird is this was not found in a skull, but you have a random set of diplodocid teeth. Anyone got a guess how in the world you can find that, but there's no skull with it? I've heard them referred to as dinosaur dentures. A hypothesis <laughs> is that these sauropods had some uh, extra tissue holding the teeth together in one unit, and when the skull would fall apart, you could have that unit. But they have found a number of these, and so that's a hypothesis. They still got the roots and everything. So, you know, the teeth were in place, but it looks like they would come out of the skull in like one package, at least in the lower jaw and upper jaw. That's a hypothesis anyway. Barosaurus, I think this is the American Museum of Natural History, where you walk in and it's just got the giant Barosaurus over you. That's again a diplodocid. Dicreosaurus is a diplodocid. This is from Cretaceous of South America, if I remember right. What's going on that's a little bit different with his back? Just a little bit different. He's curvy. 
starting to get a little bit longer spines. He's got a shorter neck too. So most sauropods, like I say, have longer necks. There's one that uh, I don't think I even have in the slide here that basically has a very short neck and it's just like someone took the tail and pulled it. His <laughs> neck went into the body. Can't remember his name off the top of my head. Here's one that's even more interesting, a margasaurus. I love that I actually laugh at this poor animal. But yeah, look at the spines on his neck. So it's, it's we're not sure, did he have a fin, like a <laughs> spinosaurus? Or were these individually covered and spiky? But he is a weird diplodocid from South America that has this mystery going on with his neck. That's again where I'm like, that would look cool or <laughs> derpy, I'm not sure. But it would be cool to see the animal. Okay, there's one called Nigersaurus, a diplodocid from south, uh, or sorry, from Africa. And it's actually got kind of sort of almost like a duck-like bill. You can see this guy's really weird because he's got all these extra teeth. He's got this duck-like bill. He's got this wide snout right here. Pretty unique uh, sauropod. What do you guys think he was doing with a wide mouth like that and a bunch of little teeth? Maybe, yeah. He was doing something, eating something special. It's hard to say for sure, but he's definitely specialized for some sort of feed. And you can just see Nigrosaurus again here with his long snout and his peg-like teeth like you see in Diplodocids. It's one of those like chip bag holders, like the clips. Oh yeah, it does look like that, doesn't it? Yeah, he was just holding bags of potato chips closed, you know, <laughs> traveling the Cretaceous. Okay, so those are Diplodocids, characterized by long necks, mostly little tiny heads, long short head, or sorry, not long short head, long low head, long tail. Then you get these guys called the macronarians. Does anyone know what your nares are? You're showing your nares right now, right out there. Nose. Your nostrils, okay. Macronaria, what does macro mean? Yes. What do you think macronaria means? Big nose. Big nose, okay. So macronarians are known for their big nose. I asked you about skulls before. That's because if you look at this skull right here, this is the actual nostril cavity. <laughs> Didn't we briefly talk about sauropods with trunks before and I had a tangent? Oh, okay. Well, let's let me do that tangent now. So these macronarians have a big nose. So we try and draw a skull here. Don't fall over. Got their bigger teeth. There we go. Got their nose right here. The eye is actually in the hole back here, that framing right there. So here's his eye. It was hypothesized that possibly these guys had trunks. And nothing, <laughs> nothing ruins the magic of sauropods to be more. That would look so weird. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it would make you know, imagine it. Um, it's like they got a long hooker hanging out of their nose or something. It's just like, it doesn't look right. It's been hypothesized they could have that, but I don't like the idea. And luckily, um, that idea is basically refuted now because they're not finding the right sort of uh, tissue attachments in the skull to support that. So hopefully they didn't have these long noses. Instead, it's thought that basically you just had kind of a fleshy pocket here. Maybe they could use it as a resonating chamber to make noise, something like that. But I do not like the, if I traveled back in time, I would like be so sad to see that. <laughs> Big nose dinosaurs, the macronarian. This is what their skull shaped like. And their teeth, they're not peg like. They're fatter. <laughs> and if you're not looking at the root right here, they've got kind of a broad leaf shape again. Um, their vertebrae are very pneumatic again. So you can see right here, here's a vertebra from Camarasaurus in the back. If you cut through the front, this is all you see for the vert right here. If you cut through the top, this is all you see. So again, they're full of air holes. So you've got Camarasaurus as an example of those. That is probably the most common dinosaur in the rocks we'll look at in Utah. Um, Brachiosaurus is there as well. This is one of the biggest. If you go to the museum in Berlin, Germany, they have a nice mounted skeleton of Brachiosaurus. It's huge. Again, you can call them big nose. And again, it was probably some sort of air sac right here, maybe for resonating or something. 
and it's thought maybe the nostrils actually did open up down here as normal. It's hard to say for sure, but again, I just don't want the trunks. <laughs> Give you a size comparison. Here is a normal brachiosaurus dorsal is back vertebrae compared to an entire human spine. So you can see they're a little bit big. And you can see why I complain about if I ever had to collect them. That's why this summer you guys are going to be the ones that uh, the follow ball. the second half of the birds as a group for me. So. <laughs> All right, there's a group of the big dumb dinosaurs <laughs> called the titanosaurs. These guys are among the biggest. So in South America, you, a lot of discoveries lately where they say the biggest dinosaur ever, it's a titanosaur. These guys have super pneumatic vertebrae. They are among the last sauropod dinosaurs. One thing that I think I ask you on your thing here that the lecture hasn't mentioned yet, so I'll mention this in case it's not in here is sauropods, I mentioned they lasted from the late Triassic to the end of the Cretaceous. They did have a regional extinction event in North America, so right here where we are, in the uh, middle of Cretaceous from about 100 to 70 million years ago, sauropods went extinct in North America. They had them everywhere else still, but they went regionally extinct in North America. Then at the very end of the age of dinosaurs, they started coming up from the south. And I've been to places in Utah where you'll find great big uh, titanosaurs and stuff that mix with T-Rex, so, which is kind of cool. But they did disappear for a while locally. Okay, so these guys are advanced big noses, super spongy vertebrae. Um, and these guys are weird. They kind of revert back to the pencil-like teeth. And they have proceless tail vertebrae, which is a really fancy way of saying, if you look at the tail bones, the end that points towards the head sticks out like this, and this end is really concave. So it's kind of like a ball and socket joint. I don't know what uh, advantage it had for them, but it's a very common feature in these titanosaurs. An example of this, I mentioned the one known from uh, Texas and Utah is Alamosaurus. This is one that they've actually found uh, T-Rex in the same rocks as these down in Texas and Utah. So yes, you would have had T-Rex fighting these giant guys if they dared. So this is like the last of the North American sauropods. These guys were immigrants coming from south. And again, they're found in New Mexico, Texas, and Utah. Just some random cool sauropods to show you size. So here's my Mentosaurus, which I believe is one of the longest neck sauropods. I mean, look at that. Things that is there. Absolutely nuts. So its neck could have had up to 19 vertebrae. They haven't got a complete specimen, but it seems to suggest something like that. And the neck would have been up to 40 feet long. Absolutely crazy. Wouldn't it be cool though if you had one like come out and then you get to sit down and you just put a little hat on? You put a little saddle on the head. Oh, I want to do like a fedora. <laughs> like that. So again, just showing you how big they are. I'm going to assume this lady's only about five feet tall, but again, you know, I'm going to have to you know, carry out a vertebra that's five feet tall. But it's so wild. Dude. It has, like, no bone figure out that big. Like, oh, and think of all the energy and time to just grow that thing. big. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mentioned Supersaurus, which was once a contender for biggest, again, depending how you define it. But uh, I guess I was wrong for my earlier statement. Apparently, it's still a valid genus. I think you were talking about Seismosaurus. Oh, yeah, Seismosaurus. Okay. So, Supersaurus, it was also at one time when I was a kid, they, for a while, was the biggest. But it's a large diplodocid. Same thing if you go down to Thanksgiving Point, which I'd love to add to our field trip if we had time, but they wouldn't give me a good price last time I asked. But um, if you go down to Thanksgiving Point, just south of Salt Lake, you can see a mounted skeleton of Supersaurus. And this is, when you can see a sauropod skeleton in person, that's pretty cool. I'll give you that. I've got a picture of my son that's, you know, sentimental value, but there's a brachiosaurus. He's on the second level of the building where this is. And there's a brachiosaurus neck with a skull way up there. And I've got this picture of him like. <laughs> he was just breaking his neck. Too. And it's just so cool. All right, so another contender or biggest again, we mentioned Ultrasaurus. Turns out Ultrasaurus was a mixture of bones from Supersaurus, which is still valid and maybe brachiosaurus. But you can look right here. This is a scientist from BYU. He's my paleo grandpa. He's my advisor's advisor, um, Jim Jensen, Dr. Jensen, that dug up a lot of these sauropods. He's one that did a lot of good science for him. Last thing to talk about, sauropod reproduction. So I mentioned the uh, prosauropods. What was weird about those prosauropod eggs? 
They're soft shell, okay? There are hard shell sauropod eggs now. Um, there's evidence for parental care, um, suggestive evidence, not entirely proved. We do know these guys nested in huge colonies. There's places in South America where literally there are square miles of the one layer of rock exposed and there's just nests and nests and nests. And that would be so stinking cool. And that is your sauropods in a, in a very rent-filled nutshell. <laughs>